uh, I would like to, to thank the, the team of organizers of uh, EPOG, both uh, professors and students for uh, this afternoon and to um, have uh, decided to invite me this afternoon to talk about the new Silk Roads. Um, I will try to respect the time limit uh, and I will just address some uh, issues linked to the Belt and Road. I, and uh, maybe uh, if there are other aspects that I have not developed that you want to talk uh, to during the discussion, you are of, of course welcome to uh, raise them. So the new Silk Road uh, were first uh, um, denominated One Belt, One Road or uh, Obor. Uh, when they were first uh, announced by uh, President uh, Xi Jinping in 2013, uh, first uh, with a, a speech in Kazakhstan and then uh, a second one in uh, Indonesia. And at the time, the project was to uh, develop uh, huge investments in infrastructure uh, in Asia, Africa and Europe. And uh, the term New Silk Road was uh, s uh, used from time to time to precisely uh, uh, stress the fact that the project was to link China with Europe, but also with uh, uh, um, Asia, because it was on the way, and uh, Africa, uh, especially the uh, east uh, side of Africa up to uh, Europe. There were uh, then... Uh, new words that were uh, used, especially uh, at the first international summit organized by uh, Beijing on the, uh, Belt, uh, on the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which was the new denomination that was uh, then uh, uh, used. Uh, and there was a new uh, geographical extension to uh, the old Pacific, uh, including uh, Latin American countries uh, on the Pacific side, such as uh, Peru or Chile, uh, for instance. Uh, and now uh, the whole Latin America uh, is included by China in the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, especially because China has turned, like elsewhere, uh, one of the major uh, destinations of export of Latin American countries. And to uh, develop their uh, presence in Latin America, China is not only trading a lot with Latin American countries, but there's now huge projects of investments uh, like um, in infrastructure like elsewhere. And uh, at the last uh, international summit uh, organized by Beijing on the uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which was uh, this year, uh, the, the geographical coverage now uh, extend to Arctic, as you know the ice is melting and there are a huge economic interest uh, in terms of uh, natural resources, uh, maybe oil, gas, but also many uh, important uh, minerals and also because it opens new maritime routes from the northeast of uh, China up to the North Pole and then to uh, the northern Europe and China has already started to uh, invest in uh, Iceland, for instance, and uh, uh, has started negotiations with Scandinavian countries to develop uh, logistic uh, bases uh, for uh, its cheap chips coming from uh, China. And there, there are even projects to uh, explore uh, the outer space. As you know, China has successfully launched uh, um, a satellite uh, in the in the space, and uh, they want to develop, like the USA or Europe, uh, their activity in the space. So you see, there's a lot to say, but I will have to uh, make choices. But first, I would like to present a, a, a map which explains better what it is. Uh, you have uh, different uh, what they call now uh, land uh, corridors. So one that uh, will link the northeast of China uh, to uh, uh, the north of Europe, crossing all the Central Asia. And uh, it means that uh, all the countries that are uh, within the corridor are including uh, in uh, strong uh, negotiations about uh, the possibility to uh, invest uh, 
not only in infrastructure but in economic uh, activities along the uh, railway lines and highways that will be built from the northeast of China up to the north of uh, Europe. And uh, the major uh, countries uh, uh, involved is, of course, Russia. And China is developing uh, its trade with uh, Russia, and Russia is very willing to develop uh, its trade with uh, China. The problem is that uh, Russia is uh, too small a market for China, uh, so it cannot be uh, a substitute to, for instance, trading with the, the USA. Uh, there is another uh, uh, route, uh, which is the new uh, uh, Eurasia Land Bridge Economic Corridor that will link uh, the eastern part of China, but more to the south, uh, around uh, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, this area, to, uh, to Germany. There are different uh, uh, corridors which link uh, China and more precisely the south of China to Southeast Asia, but also uh, with, uh, uh, with other routes going to uh, South Asia. And there is one important corridor which links uh, uh, China to uh, Pakistan. Um, the interest uh, of China to open these new uh, land routes uh, by uh, railway, highways, uh, and also uh, pipelines, is to gain access uh, directly to uh, the Arabic uh, Sea and to escape uh, the necessity to make all the uh, way from uh, China to Southeast Asia, and especially to, uh, to avoid crossing the uh, Malacca Strait. The Malacca Strait is this area that uh, starts from Singapore uh, up to uh, Malacca and then the, the north of uh, Malaysia up to the island of Penang, which is a critical uh, area for China and all the countries in the neighborhood because it is a very narrow strait where almost uh, two-thirds of uh, Chinese imports uh, cross the, uh, the, the, the sea. Uh, especially imports of oil and gas coming from the, from the Middle East. So it is a, a strategic issue for China because it is very easy for the U.S. Navy to close the uh, Malacca Strait in case of war or military tensions with China. So uh, China is uh, trying to find ways to avoid crossing uh, the Malacca Strait or to uh, be too overly dependent on the Malacca Strait. So it has tried many things. F the, may the main initiative is this uh, China-Pakistan corridor, but also the, uh, what they call the China-Indo-China uh, Peninsula uh, opens possibility to, uh, to go to uh, uh, the Indian uh, Ocean with a port in uh, uh, Myanmar, in Guadar and port also in Bangladesh. Uh, so for all these reasons, China is not only building highways, high-speed uh, railways, for instance, from, uh, from China up uh, down to Singapore, but is also building deep sea ports uh, to uh, in extend the possibilities to uh, import or export uh, uh, directly uh, without uh, this uh, long and potentially dangerous uh, maritime route that uh, crossed the Malacca uh, Strait. And th there are other maritime routes that go to uh, Eastern uh, Africa and uh, one that goes to uh, uh, Europe. And um, as you know, uh, China has started to uh, develop a lot its assets and present in the uh, south of Europe. It has bought the uh, port of uh, Piraea in Greece uh, some years ago now, during the, the, out, the, the peak of the crisis in Greece. Uh, but also in uh, Eastern uh, Europe, uh, China has already uh, a strong presence uh, in uh, different uh, countries of Eastern Europe to the point that China has already built its own institution to dialogue with East European countries, 
which is called the 16 plus one uh, group of countries and has already, I would say, successfully uh, to divide the European Union uh, in the same way that they, have, they are very successful in dividing the ASEAN group of countries in the southeast. Uh, the uh, the all divide and rule uh, mechanism is always very uh, efficient. Uh, the last thing I want to say, uh, although I may not develop it in the rest of the, my uh, presentation, is that not only it includes uh, maritime or land routes, but uh, at the same time, uh, oil and gas pipelines, uh, which are very important and they are for instance, pipeline that will uh, link China to Iran, and it will be interesting to see how it is used to defy the US ban on uh, the ir Iran e economy. In uh, the Pacific, there are also uh, other maritime routes that are developed. Well, the total cost of uh, Orbor, or the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, uh, is estimated as something around $1.5 trillion that were the figures that were announced at the time. Although we don't have precise estimates because even the Chinese don't know how much they uh, want to invest. Uh, but uh, all we know is that uh, it is a huge amount of money, something like uh, 12 times the Marshall Plan if the, 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 the Marshall Plan was uh, actualized in today's uh, value. Uh, so it is interesting to have in mind that they want to do much more than the Marshall Plan, which is sometimes used as a reference, historical uh, reference. Uh, these investments in uh, infrastructure of transport and energy and telecommunications uh, are supposed to have a dual economic effect. Uh, first, they are supposed to be investments, uh, although it is not always true, uh, but the, the, the fact that money is spent is the first economic effect because it is supposed to uh, cr uh, boost uh, economic growth, create jobs, and have uh, uh, a mobilizing effect on the rest of the local uh, economies. And then the second effect is to develop trade uh, between China and the host countries uh, so that uh, neoliberals, for instance, argue that thanks to uh, uh, more intense free trade between China and the, uh, the BR BRI host countries, uh, the, these countries will benefit too in a second um, uh, phase uh, with uh, increased uh, trade uh, with, uh, with China. And at the same time that China is uh, bargaining with these countries to uh, negotiate uh, investment in their country, they are also negotiating free trade area or investment agreements with uh, these countries. Uh, the third aspect uh, that is important to, uh, uh, to mention is that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is now the uh, pet project of uh, Xi Jinping uh, and it is also uh, enshrined in the Chinese constitution and in the core documents of the Communist Party of China to uh, stress the importance given to the BRI uh, initiative. And uh, that was done at the same time that uh, Xi Jinping was uh, given the title of core of the country uh, to, uh, uh, with the same uh, in, uh, status as uh, Mao had uh, when he was the, the leader of the CPC. And as I said, two international summits have then been uh, organized, one in 2017 and another in 2019 this year. Uh, the last uh, summit uh, uh, attracted uh, 150 countries, although officially there are around 80 to 90 uh, countries which are part of the BRI initiative. Again, uh, the, the exact number is not uh, officially defined because it is a, an ongoing and, and changing list of countries. And sometimes it is only uh, a memorandum of understanding uh, which is signed between uh, China and another countries, but nothing happened during the following years. Uh, so 
the, the status of being a BRI country is not precisely uh, defined. Uh, what was uh, important at the last summit is that for the first time, uh, G20 countries, Italy, uh, was there as uh, being a, a, a party at the uh, BRI. Uh, of, uh, Italy was highly criticized by France, uh, Germany, and other countries uh, who uh, resented Italy as uh, uh, having betrayed uh, the EU by officially joining uh, the BRI uh, initiative. Uh, Switzerland uh, wants to do the same, and I believe that in the future, new European countries will join uh, the initiative. Okay, uh, one of the strong reasons given uh, by uh, the literature to explain why China has decided to launch this uh, initiative uh, are usually the following. Uh, China's economy is hugely uh, unbalanced uh, towards uh, investment at the expense of household uh, uh, consumption. Uh, it used to involve also uh, uh, exports, uh, but now that the surplus, the trade surplus has narrowed, it is more uh, investment against uh, household consumption, and there is a necessity to rebalance the Chinese economy towards the internal market, which imply uh, redistributing uh, income in favor of households at the expense of, of capital. That is something that I will present on Friday afternoon. It's a, a short minute of uh, self-propaganda. Uh, uh, but um, I won't develop this aspect now, but we all know that uh, Chinese growth is huge, usually uh, biased towards uh, uh, fixed investment, and um, it, it has worsened when uh, the Chinese government decided uh, to uh, launch a rescue plan after the Great Recession in 2008, uh, spending uh, something around $300 billion uh, to stimulate the Chinese uh, economy. Uh, and that was successful at the short term, but uh, now uh, uh, one bad aspect is uh, dominating uh, the Chinese economy, the fact that there are huge overcapacities in heavy industries, in transport and construction. And of course, the BRI appears as a solution to export these overcapacities abroad, to use uh, the, uh, uh, these capacities to uh, uh, build more roads, more highways, more railways, uh, more ports, more uh, energy grids and telecommunication facilities in countries which sometimes don't need them as the way the Chinese conceive them. So this is one way to uh, uh, avoid uh, decreasing too fast uh, the rate of growth of the Chinese economy and to try to manage uh, the internal tensions within China uh, li uh, linked to uh, the new normal, which is a rate of growth below 6%. Uh, which is uh, probably what uh, China will have to face uh, in the near future. So, of course, there is a, a strong economic uh, uh, rationale for launching the BRI in this uh, new uh, context uh, that will last uh, for long because China has more or less completed its structural uh, change from rural economy to uh, an urban industrialized uh, economy. So the golden age of double digit growth uh, is gone forever. And there is a necessity for the Chinese government to find a solution uh, to uh, manage this uh, new economy. And the BRI initiative appears as the one of the solution to uh, precisely do that. So it looks like as China has organized everything, has planned everything, uh, is led by a very uh, rational government, uh, maybe a full rational agent at the uh, top of the CPC. This is one image given to China uh, as the country uh, which is not managed by uh, stupid guys like Trump, but with uh, leaders which really uh, have a clear mind about what they want to do, when they want to do it, and with whom. So. 
part of the literature dedicated to uh, the BRI described China and the BRI as a grand strategy, a geopolitical and diplomatic offensive, a strategy of dominance, or uh, sometimes a new imperialist uh, strategy. Um, China is accused to lend money to finance infrastructure projects uh, that host countries are incapable to uh, pay back. And this is an important, I would say, key aspect of the BRI. It is presented as a wave of investments, while at least uh, half of it, it depends on the countries, uh, are money lent by China to uh, foreign countries, and the countries will have to make sure that they will pay back the loan to China, which depends on the capacity of the new infrastructures to turn a profit. And usually the it's not the case with uh, roads, with highways, with railways, or uh, it's not uh, as easy as uh, other private economic activities to make uh, enough profit uh, to pay back uh, the debt. So there is an accusation that China is in fact uh, laying uh, 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 debt uh, trapped to uh, be able then to uh, swap this new debt by a set in the host country. Uh, so it, it looks like China has really a, a neo-imperialist strategy to colonize countries by uh, putting them into so much debt that they are not able to pay back the debt, and in this case, China uh, says their assets. This is an accusation which, uh, again, looks, I would say, very uh, rational, uh, grounded in some reality, uh, and it is also very uh, useful for some governments, some politicians, to accuse China of doing this. For instance, uh, some someone that probably you don't like too much, John Bolton, uh, the US National Security Advisor, uh, stated that China is making use of debt to hold states in Africa captive to Beijing's wishes and demands. Uh, this quotation is interesting because you can see the same accusation pronounced by uh, people which belong to uh, political uh, uh, antipodes uh, from Bolton uh, to uh, a radical leftist uh, which uh, was not from some Maoist uh, groups uh, can say exactly the same or someone which has no political I would say involvement could look at the facts and say well it's true that it is a very smart Chinese uh, strategy to colonize uh, again Africa or other uh, developing countries uh, from other continents. So my question is that, is it true that uh, new silk roads are new uh, debt uh, traps? My way to answer the question is first to look at the origin, which is the nature of the Chinese states. I know that uh, uh, in this conference there are some panels dedicated to whether China was a socialist or still is a socialist country, whether it is now turned in uh, a capitalist country with uh, some uh, specific uh, 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 varieties of, uh, of capitalism, uh, I would uh, say directly that, to my understanding, Chinese was never a socialist country. You can say that it was a planned economy, but a socialist country, it's a, another kind of debate. And for me, there is no discussion, no hesitation at all that China is now a capitalist country, but with very specific characteristics. Which, and it is true of all capitalist countries. Japan has never been the same as the USA, for instance. Uh, and I would like to uh, use uh, the, uh, the work of uh, Minier, uh, which has developed the idea of a fragmented state, uh, Li Jones and Jing Ganzeng, uh, which argue that China is a regulatory state. Um, but I believe that uh, the one that has the provided the best explanation of what the Chinese state is, is Ao Longyu, uh, in a book public in 2012, where he developed the concept of bureaucratic uh, capitalism. I would just mention uh, 
say a few words about the first uh, reference, Stefan Halper, Halper, The Beijing Consensus, which is a, a, a book that used, in fact, a, 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 a very famous uh, expression, the Beijing Consensus, that he did not uh, invent uh, himself. But this is the idea that China is an authoritarian capitalism. The problem with uh, th this characterization is not the, the, about the, the authoritarian uh, ca uh, character of the Chinese government and, uh, its, uh, and the Chinese state. It is the fact that uh, in this category of authoritarian capitalism, the author and other authors uh, put uh, together many different countries. So uh, you can say that Indonesia uh, was an authoritarian state, that Singapore is still an authoritarian state, that uh, Thailand is for sure uh, an authoritarian state, uh, that Malaysia used to be recently an authoritarian state, and we will see if it democratized uh, or not. Uh, Iran is uh, included in the same category of authoritarian state. In fact, you put in the same basket countries which are very different, which have a very different history, some who had uh, uh, experienced a uh, socialist revolution and then became uh, officially socialist uh, states and countries which have never experienced this kind of dramatic historic, uh, historical event. So I don't believe that it is useful to uh, simply uh, characterize China as an authoritarian form of capitalism. It is, it is necessary to go beyond and say much more precisely what China is. So uh, I believe that it is better to characterize China as a bureaucratic capitalism, which means that, uh, of course, there is a bourgeoisie in, in China. There is a, 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 an appropriation of the means of production by a ruling class, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the, the new bourgeoisie uh, of China, which come from the bureaucracy uh, which used to rule China uh, before 1978. So the term bureaucratic capitalism was first coined by Maurice Messner in his book uh, in 1996, The Deng Xiaoping Era, an inquiry into the fate of Chinese socialism. And it has been expanded, as I said, by uh, Ao Long Yu uh, in his uh, book in 2012. And I will summarize the major uh, idea uh, in this book. Uh, in which I have uh, modestly contributed a chapter. Uh, but um, he says that the start of the restoration of capitalism uh, is uh, in 1978, uh, when Deng Xiaoping uh, decided officially uh, that uh, it was necessary for China to reintroduce progressively market mechanism in the Chinese economy to make some experience in the uh, Shenzhen uh, Special Zone, uh, which was a, a, a copy of what Hong Kong uh, was, uh, and then to extend the experiment to other parts of China and to, re to introduce uh, uh, bit by bit uh, the market uh, mechanisms. Uh, in the process, the, bu the bureaucracy of the party state has thoroughly bourgeois bourgeoisified itself, turned itself into uh, a new uh, bourgeoisie. Why? Uh, because there were different waves of privatization of the uh, Chinese uh, economy. The first one was the privatization of small and medium state-owned uh, enterprises. And then uh, the privatization of the large uh, st uh, state-owned uh, enterprises, which uh, form joint ventures with foreign capital. And this is very important to see that uh, these uh, officially uh, state companies uh, are I strongly, intimately linked to foreign private companies. Uh, as if, for instance, uh, uh, EDF uh, in France had formed a joint company with a private U.S. company to uh, produce and sell uh, electricity. This is what happened for all the uh, major industrial uh, activities uh, in China to produce a whole set of industrial uh, uh, goods. 
uh, and then uh, was later extended to uh, some other uh, activities. And the second wave of, of privatization uh, in the 90s was uh, the privatization of urban and suburban land. Not rural land, but urban and suburban land, which uh, uh, gave a strong impetus to uh, speculation in real estate, for instance. And uh, alongside these uh, public uh, bureaucrats uh, turned uh, new bourgeois, you have uh, a, a, a private sector uh, in China, which in part uh, benefited uh, from the wave of privatization of uh, previously uh, state companies, but also uh, a private sector that was created by uh, all the new uh, businessmen and, and business women in China, which decided to save the opportunities to create private companies uh, in, uh, in China with the uh, uh, formal authorization of the government. So I want to stress the fact that the bureaucracy owns directly or indirectly uh, uh, capital uh, directly when uh, it decides to create private companies. So you have families of bureaucrats that uh, create uh, private companies. Uh, it's not a Chinese exception. In Indonesia, uh, during the Suharto uh, era, uh, a dictator that uh, lasted more than 20 years in power, you had also uh, ministers who decided to create their own business and because they were ministers, they could sign all the necessary forms to make it legal. So in China, it happened many times. And uh, now we know more that the fact that many uh, CPC or uh, state leaders are also billionaires because their family own uh, big business uh, companies that make a lot of profit or they uh, own uh, capital directly in uh, other forms. For instance, they receive shares from the private sector as a bribe. Sometimes it can be uh, legal. And they appoint the heads of the major state-owned uh, companies. And these companies then uh, are listed uh, at the stock exchange in China or outside of China. And there are many ways to uh, capture part of the profit made by these companies. Uh, uh, to the benefit of the, uh, the bureaucrats. So we can say that the, the bureaucracy is not only a, a bourgeoisie that owns directly the means of production, but receives also uh, revenues from a kind of collective bureaucratic uh, capital. <coughs> Another uh, type of bureaucratic capital is when government departments create their own companies in China or abroad mostly in business sectors that uh, fall in their particular jurisdiction. This is explicitly uh, illegal. State companies have not the legal possibility to create private companies, but nonetheless, they do it. So you have uh, uh, the department of uh, the police in this municipality, which decide to create its own private companies, uh, you have the army creating its own uh, company elsewhere and so many agents and departments and ministers and that do the same. Once again, it is not a Chinese exception. In Thailand, uh, e even back in the 30s, the army had creating, uh, for instance, tobacco companies uh, to, to make profit to, uh, directly for uh, the generals who, who were not paid enough, of course. Uh, so this accumulation of legal and illegal uh, revenues constitute a bureaucratic uh, capital. The private sector is expanding, but remains closely articulated and subordinated to the state sector. The difference between the public and the private sector is not very clear uh, in China, uh, but both uh, have benefited from uh, rapid growth. High growth, as I said, is, makes consensus uh, in China. It is the cement of the economy and the society. As long as they have high growth, they can manage the social tensions. The problem, once again, is that now 
China is entering into a so slow growth uh, era. So what is this uh, analysis of the state uh, important? Because it is important to understand that when China launches the uh, BRI uh, initiative, uh, it will not turn magically into a centrally and rationally planned initiative by a very centralized state, but it will be done by a state which is fragmented, decentralized and internationalized. So it will change the way this initiative will be implemented in uh, reality. So I don't have time to develop, because I'm already too late, this different aspect of the Chinese state being fragmentized, decentralized, and uh, uh, internationalized. But just a few words uh, about the way uh, uh, the, the BRI uh, is implemented. It means that first, uh, the central state will have to mobilize all the different levels of the bureaucracy to implement and take the initiative to implement the Belt and Road uh, initiatives. Uh, in this process, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is not the strongest actor. There are the different ministers, such as the Ministers of Economy and Finance, which in China is called the National uh, Development Reform uh, Committee. Uh, there are also the Ministry of uh, uh, of transport, of energies, which have usually a much better say in what is being done officially in the name of BRI uh, abroad. And you have all the different uh, government of the provinces, which also take the initiative to develop the BRI abroad or not to do it. It all depends on their goodwill. And you had, uh, for instance, the vice prime uh, minister, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, I have to uh, skip a lot of, uh, of slides, uh, uh, who had to uh, tour uh, the whole China to convince uh, that uh, it was necessary to uh, mobilize and implement uh, the, uh, the BRI. Uh, well, I will skip it. Uh, and to summarize, I want to say that uh, our interpretation of the BRI initiative is to avoid uh, different uh, extreme uh, interpretation. The first uh, is the uh, idea that, uh, sorry, uh, that uh, the BRI is a top-down uh, strategy which is completely managed and controlled by the central uh, government, which would be contrary to the uh, uh, internal reality of the Chinese state, the way it is decentralized, fragmented, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, out of uh, control of the central authorities. And there is another uh, uh, error I think of interpretation, which is to, uh, to say that because the Chinese state is so fragmented and uh, decentralized, uh, all the, the initiatives taken by the different uh, uh, fragments of the state are completely disorganized without the control of the central government. I think that the reality lies somewhere in, in the middle so it's not easy to, uh, to say precisely where it is. It all depends on the circumstances and the internal relation of forces uh, within uh, the Communist Party of China and, uh, and the state. But just to mention some reason to believe that the BRI, the BRI is not completely uh, disorganized, uh, I would I would like to mention some important uh, geostrategic uh, uh, interest of the central uh, government. For instance, the South China Sea. As you know, uh, China has decided that the whole South China Sea is under its sovereignty. It's part of its territory. And it has uh, decided to turn small islands into military bases to occupy the South China Sea sometimes very close to the neighboring countries. For instance, I live in Brunei, 
The first island contested by China is something around 15 kilometers far from the shore. So all, uh, for instance, uh, expatriates that go on a, a sea trip, they can go easily during the day to this uh, island and meet the Chinese Navy. Uh, another example is the Strait of Malacca. Uh, the central government really has a strategic interest to decrease the dependence on the Strait of Malacca. So they will do whatever they can to achieve this goal, uh, even it is if it means going beyond the internal disorganization of the, uh, of the, Chinese, uh, of the Chinese states. So I would say that there are some central issues linked usually to geostrategic issues of China where the central government will put all its might to make sure that the goal is achieved. For the rest, the internal competition between Chinese capitalist bureaucrats can decide what will be done or what will not uh, be done. Now, going to uh, the second question, in, if I can take uh, 10 more minutes, about uh, the, uh, the debt uh, trapped, I would like to rely on some uh, investigation done by, uh, in particular, uh, uh, sorry, once again, John Hurley, Scott Morris, and Galen Portland, which have uh, published, I would say, the most comprehensive uh, analysis of the link between the, the debt and the uh, Chinese uh, projects in a country officially under the umbrella of the uh, BRI. Uh, they have constructed what they uh, call a lending pipeline of BRI project, which includes any project uh, beyond the end of 2016, which basically includes projects announced in 2017 and now 2018 and 19 or previous announced project, but they were what, which were delayed and implemented after 2016. And they focus on 23 countries at risk of debt distress today. The notion of debt distress being uh, used from the IMF and the World Bank, which can be criticized, so they put the, the level uh, at 60% uh, of the GDP, beyond 60%. IMF and the World Bank say that uh, a country is at risk of debt uh, distress. The difficulty in this kind of investigation is the data. To know what uh, BRI projects are, you need to uh, collect all the official announcement in the media, uh, which is not uh, very uh, easy because you need to mobilize a team of people who will look one by one all the announcements of the uh, of the project, you don't have a database at, uh, ready at, uh, at end. There are different uh, research centers at John Hopkins University, uh, at Boston University, which are doing this for Africa, for Latin America, but you don't have a comprehensive world database uh, to uh, evaluate all the, the project. So basically what they did, they selected 68 countries, they removed 35 countries uh, which are rated investment grade and uh, far from being in debt distress. So that left 23 countries uh, at risk of debt uh, distress today. And from these 23 countries, they built what they call their BRI lending uh, pipeline. They removed 15 countries uh, for which uh, the, the inclusion of the lending pipeline does not increase the level of debt beyond the 60%. And it left uh, uh, eight countries, which when you include the lending pipeline, uh, their debt jumped beyond the 60% uh, threshold. So you can see that there are only eight countries among uh, an initial sample of 68 uh, countries uh, analyzed. So uh, it is a minority of countries, but of course it is significant cases. So on the x ax uh, axel, axis, you have the uh, debt, uh, the share of debt in GDP, the public debt, 
Uh, so you have countries like uh, Sri Lanka, which have a public debt of around 85% uh, of GDP uh, at the time the study uh, was done. And you have uh, Afghanistan, which at the start has a debt of less than 10%. On the y-axis, you have the share of uh, the Chinese debt uh, within the total external debt. The idea is when you include the debt uh, uh, the, the pipeline, the lending pipeline, uh, to measure uh, if a country increase its overall debt due to an increase of debt uh, owed to China, you see. And on the uh, right hand side, you have uh, this minority of countries for which it is the case. The fact that China has lent them a lot of money to invest in BRI project has increased significantly uh, their uh, debt to uh, uh, higher levels. So this is the case of Kyrgyzstan, of Laos, uh, of Maldives, although it is more the share of Chinese debt that increase than the overall debt uh, uh, in itself. You don't have countries that goes from the left hand side to the right hand side just because of uh, the fact that China has decided to lend to these countries. But you do have countries for which there is a significant uh, increase, but not many. So I would like to uh, talk just uh, a few words about Sri Lanka. Uh, and if uh, in the discussion we can talk about Pakistan, Laos, and other countries. In Africa, Djibouti is a very significant case because China has developed a military base uh, 15 kilometers far from the French Chinese base, uh, the French uh, military base uh, in Djibouti. And uh, China wants to link Ethiopia to Djibouti thanks to a huge railway, which explains that Ethiopia is probably soon crossing the 60% uh, line. So what I can say very rapidly about Sri Lanka, which is presented as the poster child of debt trap. You can read uh, the media, you will always find Sri Lanka presented as the proof that there is a Chinese debt trap or a Chinese debt diplomacy. And the, the example which is used is the uh, case of the uh, Amban Tota uh, port, which is in the south of Sri Lanka. The capital is there, Colombo, where there is already a deep sea port which is being extended by China, uh, which is reclaiming land uh, in the sea, but also by Japan and uh, India, which now have uh, uh, their own project of extension of the Colombo deep sea port. But here in Amban, Tota, you have a deep sea port which was uh, ex uh, created, extended by a Chinese company. So why I it is not, in fact, uh, a case of debt trap? It is when you look at the history of the Amban Tota uh, port, you will see that for a long time, it has been uh, deemed as the right place to develop a, a second deep sea port in Sri Lanka. Uh, you had French companies who did feasibility studies uh, in um, uh, the 90s, then again, uh, other uh, feasibility studies by uh, Danish uh, companies. The French company uh, Port Autonome de Marseille uh, offered to do also a feasibility studies. Uh, the French co uh, firm uh, Compagnie Maritime, uh, Compagnie Générale Maritime CGM, which is the world's third largest container ship company express an interest in uh, developing this, uh, this port. I mention this because it all shows when you go into the detail that it is not a Chinese story in Sri Lanka. Uh, and it is an old project that has been in fact developed by Chinese companies because they were able to lobby the Sri Lanka government to uh, really uh, create the, uh, the, the, the port together with the uh, uh, Sri Lankan uh, financial port, uh, port authority. So it was done. Uh, it was in part successful uh, when the port was created. It was in line with the projection of some of the feasibility studies. 
but it was not a complete success because the Chinese company who got the contract was not able to attract enough business in the port to make it really uh, profitable. So it went uh, it, 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 in huge loss at a time when Sri Lanka was already hugely indebted, uh, but not because of the Chinese, because of the civil war in Sri Lanka, and then because the Sri Lankan government applied a neoliberal agenda and decided to uh, take many debts on the foreign bond market, uh, for instance. So the fact that Sri Lanka was already hugely indebted and the fact that the uh, port at Ambantota was not profitable convinced the then government to, se to sell the port uh, because it was not only uh, unable to pay back the debt, but because it needed the uh, proceed of the sale of the port to pay some arrears on their uh, foreign debt. And this is the case which is presented as the poster child of the uh, Chinese debt trap. In fact, China owns only 10% of the debt of the total debt of Sri Lanka. Okay? The next case, which is important to study, but I will not be do it because I'm already too late, is Pakistan, uh, which is the major economic corridor of the BRI uh, project, but we can talk about it later. But in short, the story is the same. Pakistan has a long history of uh, IMF uh, a rescue plan. It, uh, it is the 13th, which has been signed uh, in May of this year with the IMF. So you can't say that China created the debt in Pakistan. Uh, it belongs to the history of Pakistan and the way it was uh, managed or not managed, I would say mismanaged. Although uh, China has invested or lent something like 90 billion of US dollars in Pakistan to create this direct access to, uh, to the sea for, uh, for China. Uh, so. To finish, I would say that it's, it's not possible to say that China has a deliberate strategy of uh, debt di diplomacy to uh, trap countries into debt and then seize its uh, uh, assets. Uh, what you can say is that there are some countries which were already indebted, fragile, and the huge investment or loans given by China to implement the BRRI will compound the difficulties that these countries are experiencing. That is for sure. Second, the problem, the major problem of the BRI project is that they don't benefit the local economy and the local people. The projects are realized by Chinese companies due to their own interest, not to the interest of the local economy. They are, the, pro the infrastructure is being uh, realized by Chinese companies with Chinese workers, so there is almost no job creation for the local people. And worse, it damages the local economy. For instance, in uh, Gwada, in Baluchistan, in Pakistan, the fishermen uh, are now prohibited to fish around the, uh, the construction of the Gwada port. Uh, and these are uh, poor people who depend on fishing to feed their family and to make a living. And not only the highways, the uh, railways are not for them because it is not too expensive, but it will ruin their way of, uh, of living. Same story in Cambodia with the new development of, no of Phnom Penh. Poor people were chased away to uh, re recreate the, uh, the, the city. Same story in Laos, where six billion of US dollars were spent to, to uh, build a high, um, uh, high speed train to uh, jo uh, uh, link China with uh, th uh, Thailand and hopefully in the future uh, uh, Malaysia and Singapore. You won't see a lot of Laotian people using the high speed train simply because they don't have the money to buy the ticket and they are not even building the railway. So the same story happens also in Africa, and I think th this is the major problem of uh, the BRI. It is a lot of debt, a lot of risk 
for big business interests and not for the local communities. Sorry for being so long. Uh, thank you, Professor Bruno. So at this point, we're going to open the floor uh, for questions from the audience. Um, what we'll do is we'll collect around two to three questions um, per round, um, and then we'll have you answer them. All right. Um, we'll begin here. Thank you, Bruno, for the very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I, I'm also doing some researches on the Belt and Road Initiative, and I have some hypotheses that I want to, to comment on. Uh, actually, when we look for the reasons of the Belt and Road, we can find diverse reasons, actually. They, they are trying to deal with their idle capacity, as you showed. Uh, they are trying to reduce the costs of the, for the global value chains, uh, for, the, for the goods which arrive in China. They are trying to foster the internationalization of the renminbi through the belt and road as well so there are many diverse aspects on it but finally if you can if you have to go into one specific reason uh, and, and that's my question uh, what i see is that even if there are different kinds of capitalism there is one characteristic of capitalism which is always there which is the necessity of extroversion uh, capital itself has to, to, to uh, has this uh, trend or this necessity of extroversion. So uh, my question is, if you also see this uh, Belt and Road Initiative as responding to a historical necessity of extroversion of the Chinese economy, because there are many debates as well about the cultural aspects in China that r historically made them be more introversive than extroversive. But then now we see this extroversion and uh, the, the point, and this is another question, is, is that it tends to create more and more tensions. So uh, we see it already with the US, and I'd like you to comment also in, in, in Asia, in, in, in the region where you, you have been probably traveling and working, uh, how, how you see these tensions. We'll have two more. Thanks, Bruno, for this very, very illuminating uh, discussion. Uh, I, I was fascinated by this uh, idea of the fragmented state, because I've been looking at the idea of what they were launching also in terms of the ecological civilization, and they have, you know, different ministries with very different definitions of green and what it means and, and how it gets handled. So it, I know that they have issues in terms of coordination and turf battles between different groups of the government. But you have not referred to the fact that this Belt and Road Initiative coincided with the restructuring of the Chinese state through centralized, more centralized power uh, through Xi Jinping and also the anti-corruption uh, campaign that he's launched, which is a form of centralization. And so I was wondering to what extent the, 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 the two run parallel, right? To the extent of regrouping the state enterprises and, and perhaps getting a more centralized control over the Chinese state. All right, we'll just uh, do one more and then we'll give the floor to you. So thank you, first, uh, for the illuminating and uh, uh, I think it's really a deep uh, um, analysis of the situation. Uh, that's, I mean, it's the, the most important uh, geopolitical issue for the next uh, century. I wanted to, to add a little uh, point when, um, when you were speaking about joint ventures between uh, public uh, companies and uh, uh, bringing capital flows from, uh, from uh, uh, international markets. Uh, the, the, the other side of the story, it's uh, the knowledge uh, acquisition that uh, the companies uh, have brought to to China and China has uh, obliged all the companies to bring the knowledge bring the capital but with joint ventures and uh, uh, having a market big as uh, <laughs> 1.5 uh, billion uh, in a couple of years 
uh, I, I saw just a little news just to, to, to illuminate this point. Like BMW brought uh, uh, the um, part of uh, production in China. And on the other side of China, uh, without nobody knowing nothing, they opened a, a second uh, industry creating the same model of uh, BMW but with another logo and uh, in the in the same time and nobody could uh, could uh, could know that cuz it was on the other side of china and uh, and even when they started selling it nobody knew until not but even like BMW that is one of the most important companies in the world cannot uh, uh, know what's going on in the f in the whole area of china and the government of of course has not uh, uh, the interest to, to deal with this uh, part of uh, um, of uh, controlling, I mean. Um, and so uh, BMW just understood the situation when it was too late. And then they began doing all the process. The other, but this is to add something. And instead my, my question wants to be on uh, the other side of the story, that is when uh, um, China, a private uh, company, but founded by the state, goes uh, uh, in other places, and uh, they have to compete with uh, um, with uh, the uh, in the market. And uh, we are all know that the neoclassical view uh, says that uh, uh, the state has not to intervene and to fund this part, uh, like the the industries and uh, and this uh, competition so is uh, um, it should be illegal uh, at least uh, from a neoclassical point of view but Chinese companies has entered the market everywhere in the world and uh, I don't know WTO and what kind of process uh, to limit this uh, uh, this thing has been uh, done so the, the question is uh, if you can, uh, uh, if you know, if you, uh, this part of the story, because I don't know a lot. Thank you. All right, I think um, we'll give it to you to comment on these questions. Yes. Thank you for, for, for all your questions and comments. Um, there is a necessity of extraversion, yes, uh, from all capitalist companies everywhere. There are different reasons that are uh, usually mentioned. Once uh, the internal market has already been explored and there is no possibility to expand the, 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 the sales within the domestic market, then companies will look abroad, uh, of course. In the case of China, uh, it's, it's not uh, obvious to say that all the business opportunities within, market, uh, within the Chinese market have been explored. Uh, first, because it is a country where the level of revenues uh, is increasing, so you have uh, an enlarging middle class which is still uh, expanding and buy uh, uh, goods and services. But uh, for the first time, for instance, the, the automobile market has started to uh, decline in, uh, in China. So there are signs that show that, uh, again, the golden age uh, it belongs to the past. Uh, and long before uh, it happened, Ch Chinese companies have already decided to become multinational. So to acquire foreign technologies, of course, but they had already acquired it uh, within China. Uh, but when they become uh, multinational, it is to, to, to buy companies, foreign companies abroad, to have access to their uh, technologies, uh, to uh, be uh, like other foreign companies, able to raise capital abroad, uh, which uh, will make it uh, easier for them uh, because they won't depend on Chinese public companies to get uh, financing, but they will raise it directly in uh, foreign markets abroad. So there are many reasons that explain that you have al already a lot of Chinese multinationals uh, around the world which compete with the other multinationals and, for, and they use the same tricks and they, they develop the same kind of, uh, of strategies. Their particularity is that some of them are public companies, uh, but they behave like almost private companies. And they are uh, companies for which you can't say a lot. For instance, Huawei 
is officially a kind of cooperative. It is officially the property of its trade union, but everybody uh, laugh at the idea that it is only a, a, a cooperative that belongs to the trade union, of course. But is it, uh, is it a private company? Is it a public company? There is some uh, difficulty to understand what it is exactly. Uh, but we know for sure that it is a very powerful global company now. Uh, uh, so, uh, tensions um, uh, in, uh, within China, that, that's for sure. Uh, and this uh, leads me to the, some comments about uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, there are different uh, evaluations of the power of Xi Jinping uh, today. And uh, I, I can't say that uh, I know for sure what is the, the, the right uh, analysis. Some say that uh, he wants to, he, he, he is the most one powerful leader that China has uh, ever had since Mao. Uh, and some others say that uh, because he is uh, very uh, uncertain about his uh, own future, uh, the best way is to put his enemies into prison. And this is one reason of the uh, campaign against uh, corruption. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, he is in a very difficult situation if he lose the trade war with the US, uh, which may happen, at least in some, in some ways. Uh, he has to deal with uh, an economy which is not going so well. Uh, there is a lot of internal debt by local uh, provinces and municipalities in China, and uh, it is not that uh, simple to uh, overcome this potential uh, debt crisis uh, in China a and there are also uh, internal tensions because the rate of growth is decreasing and it is getting more difficult for, for the Chinese, uh, young Chinese to find uh, a decent job and get uh, married and uh, as you know they need uh, to buy uh, an apartment before being able to uh, attract a potential uh, spouse. Uh, and so all these internal uh, tensions in China are, are now uh, increasing and Xi Jinping may be uh, ejected from, from power in one or two years. Uh, uh, we, we don't know uh, precisely. So uh, the, the authors I have mentioned, for instance, uh, uh, Minye and uh, Li Jones and Jing Gongzheng, they, they don't believe that uh, Xi Jinping is a strong leader and so powerful as it, uh, as it looks. Uh, but I, I, can't be, uh, I can't be for sure. All right. Maybe, maybe we have some Yeah, we'll go for another round. Yeah. Um, any more questions from the floor? All right. Um, there's been some very interesting research, I think, by economic geographers showing that accumulation is increasingly taking the form, uh, in accelerating it. It started before the crisis uh, 10 years ago, but uh, has accelerated since, in which very, very close, concentrated networks of global production companies, global financial companies, and the state, through networks of ownership, directorships, and otherwise, are essentially running the world economy now. Um, and it's not surprising that this should increasingly take the form of infrastructural projects. And they actually say, you know, and China is one particular example of this. So I'm, I'm kind of interested whether you feel that we should see China as exceptional, you know, obviously with different balances in other companies, given the weight of the state in ownership of finance and production or whether actually it is conforming to what is the particular type of accumulation taking place under neoliberalism more generally, where big infrastructural projects funded by the state through private finance and private companies is actually becoming more and more common, even if you know, China is uh, even heavier weighted in, in this sort of direction. Okay, we have two more here in the back. Well, thank you for your presentation. I was a bit unclear about 
your point about excess capacity. You say that they've made the structural transformation from a rural economy to an urban industrialized economy. And you're also saying that you have a lot of infrastructure and capacity which is just idle. So I'm just curious as to what do you think would be the consequences of this idle capacity in the next foreseeable future? Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, I kind of related, I just wanted to ask, do you see China is, so you, say, you mentioned that they have this overcapacity, but in some sense, are they exporting this overcapacity to other places? Because a lot of the places they're going to are obviously less developed countries that don't necessarily, like for example, the example of Sri Lanka, where they couldn't find enough ships to actually maintain, uh, to maintain revenue uh, to the port. And slightly related to that, given that they may be investing in things that might not see a return for a long time, or maybe not at all, based on the condition of the countries they're in, um, do you see the debt, uh, I think recently there was some debt relief, um, or some renegotiations of the debt, do you see these debt reliefs as something that will provide genuine relief, or is it just, I guess, I suppose, a sort of PR stunt to counter claims that they're trying to trap these countries in debt to uh, gain assets from them? All right, thank you. Uh, Bruno, if you'd like to comment on these. Yes, please. For, for the first question, uh, really, I don't have the, the answer because, uh, but I tend to believe that there is a kind of uh, Chinese uh, exception, closeness that makes difficult for the major uh, Chinese companies to simply integrate into a kind of global networks, uh, precisely because they tend to, uh, to, to, to stay within Chinese companies uh, uh, and they, they just develop relations with companies that are outside of the Chinese world whenever they need technologies, assets, uh, uh, business link that they don't have. Uh, but once they have it, they tend to expel all other uh, com potential competitors or, or Western companies or, 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 or so forth. Uh, which probably makes them different from European, American or other Asian companies uh, which tend to uh, develop more long-term relations and even merge or for instance, we don't have uh, uh, an example of a big Chinese company which has merged with an American or European companies as the kind of discussion we have between uh, Fiat and Renault, for instance, and Nissan. Uh, it, it may happen in the future, who knows, but for, 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 for the moment, it, it does not seem to be part of uh, uh, usual business. Uh, so this is why I think they are still a, a bit apart but probably they, they tend to integrate. Uh, it, it is an open question. Uh, regarding the surplus capacity and structural transformation, uh, 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 there, these are different uh, things. The structural transformation is something that you observe in uh, all uh, countries which are experiencing a transition from basically a rural economy where the majority of the people live in the back country to a more urban and industrialized economy. Uh, and now mo around 60% of Chinese are living within cities and work either for the industry or the service activities. Uh, when this is the, the case, a country is more industrialized, depends more on industry and services. In the past, there was this uh, idea that uh, first agriculture, then industry, and finally services. Uh, we have observed in many countries that uh, this transition is not that, that such. Indus the industry and services tend to grow at the same uh, time uh, and, not l and services not later than industry. Again, in China, there is some exception due to the fact that before 1978, they had given a lot of emphasis on industry for different reasons. And after the reintroduction of capitalism, the government has developed further uh, the industry, the importance of industry. And this is why they have a legacy of 
huge capacities in heavy industries uh, and with the stimulus plan of uh, 2008 it has worsened okay and and in many areas they don't know what to do uh, with these uh, capacities for instance china has already the largest network of high-speed train uh, of the world and there are many uh, uh, lines which are not profitable at all uh, because there are no passengers and so uh, you you may be happy to travel in china being the the the, the only passenger of you you will have the whole uh, train for you and travel at 300 kilometers uh, there are some articles in the press that are talking about this you see so of course these companies these chinese companies they want to keep on building new uh, railways uh, or highways or whatever outside of china not because they can't build more railways although it does not make a lot of sense and they are still building a lot of railways in china uh, uh, to to go from uh, the east coast uh, up to the uh, himalayas of course and from the himalayas to pakistan uh, uh, but uh, they need to make some profit out of it sometimes uh, and going abroad is good because it is paid by Chinese banks. So uh, even if it is not profitable, once the highway is built in, say, uh, um, uh, Thailand, uh, it will be transferred to a Thai company which will have the responsibility to, to manage the highway or the railway, make profit and pay back the debt to the Chinese uh, bank. But the Chinese company, which will have built the, the railway or the highway, will have already cashed in uh, and, and, and won't be uh, in any trouble for uh, any difficulty to pay back the debt. So this is what they are looking for. Okay? And uh, uh, debt relief, yes, China is giving a lot of debt relief and it is considered as a much better uh, creditor than the IMF or uh, other uh, Western uh, cred banks or creditors in the sense that they give more easily uh, debt uh, relief uh, or renegotiate the, the loan uh, much more flexibly than the, the World Bank uh, for, for instance. Uh, and there are also some reasons for it. W countries which have borrowed a lot of money uh, to China, China is in the same position as other creditors. They don't want this country to go completely bankrupt because they, they will be sure that they won't pay back their debt. So they tend to uh, refinance uh, these countries. It was the case of uh, Ethiopia, of Pakistan recently, uh, of Djibouti, uh, where China has huge interest. Uh, so my advice for uh, anyone who will lead a, a, a country in the future, if you, f if you want to borrow to the Chinese, borrow a lot of money and not <laughs> and not small amount of money <laughs> that's sound advice um we have time for another round of questions any from the floor there you go yeah oh okay Thank you, Bruno, for this uh, impressive uh, presentation. I think for uh, our student here. Uh, of course, talking about Europe and talking about the U.S. Uh, is very important. Um, now, I, I think if they do not have this kind of discussion, they will be out of the, of the game because we have to, to understand sometimes, even if we know that the currency is not that important internationally, uh, they, they are driving uh, China and the, in, in, in Asia is driving the world uh, in a way or another in the next centuries and we have to understand things so I think it, it was very uh, illuminating interesting and 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 shocking sometimes because uh, we don't know what to do but um, I think it was also very interesting that in of course when you say new imperial uh, uh, strategy um, I was I would be the first to say yes they're in imperial because in Latin America they, they come with their, their capital and they just buy what's under the, the ground, above the ground, and some people that work of the, they, they buy everything. Uh, some countries are really, it's really impressive. But I think you point out some uh, uh, more subtle uh, elements. And I was just pointing out that I think 
uh, even if uh, I'm sure it will be uh, successful for a renewal. But I think putting a stress on this dynamic to understand globali globalized economy. If we don't have a one course, or uh, I discuss it with uh, some uh, some student, uh, it's, uh, it's it's a lack of, of uh, understanding the work. And I think your presentation it was not there was no specific uh, question. I was just uh, taking the opportunity to to congratulate you. All right. One minute. I want to come back to Europe and the US. I mean, uh, <laughs> in your opinion, what do you think? Uh, I mean, you, you told about divide and rule strategy uh, of China. Uh, I, 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 I thought it was really also interesting to understand this fragmented state, which is, uh, which is not the usual idea we, learn, we hear about. Uh, but what do you think uh, in Europe uh, should be the strategy, or at least a country like France on the one side, and we, we feel that the U.S. have some, uh, there is some tension between the U.S. and China currently, and so what, <laughs> what do you think would be an interesting, a good strategy for, for the country that are in a way threatened by this, uh, by this patent hold initiative? I hope, if you don't mind, um, Mariam and I just has um, a couple of questions of, of ours, and I guess because we're part of the region you've been talking about, but relatedly to what David was saying is that um, the Belt and Road Initiative you're speaking of, I think, is all about engendering um, foreign diplomacy and economic participation for both China and the neighboring countries. But, I mean, you know, China has many faces, and in that sense, how do you contextualize that against those, I mean, two prominent ones, which is one, the very aggressive military posturing of China, and then the other one is the highly inequitable development where you see states like Shanghai and Guangzhou prosper, but then you have provinces like Yunnan left behind. How do you reconcile all those objectives with the current realities of the country? And I think also Mariam has a question. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, Somehow, I, I understood out of your conclusion that it's actually difficult to try to, uh, to get generalizations about the reasons or the motivations of the BRI. And uh, maybe you tried to illustrate this with the case of Sri Lanka, uh, because um, it seemed to me that, okay, it's not only that we have to understand the internal politics of China, but sometimes also the internal politics of the recipient countries because somehow this explains why such projects uh, have been uh, agreed about or have started. Uh, and in the case of, um, of Sri Lanka, somehow also I, uh, I drew some similarities with the case of Egypt, although it seemed on, uh, on your graph that it was a small contribution, but it's not. Uh, I think it's just the small size of Egypt uh, compared to the, uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, we have a very big public debt, uh, and so the effect of China maybe is not very obvious. Um, however, I again, for, 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 for the case of Egypt, we have these uh, types of uh, heavy infrastructure uh, in the Suez Canal or around, uh, we were just talking about this before the session, and uh, these are like projects that have been on the government's agenda for years and years and before even the revolution, maybe 20 years ago, but they never came out to the implementation, maybe due to the lack of uh, financial resources or maybe they were just a type of propaganda for uh, uh, elections and so. So uh, do you think this can be like a um, common case where, where China tries to see where it can uh, fit into the country's uh, economic uh, plans and, uh, and uh, tie, it, tie itself with the, with the governments and the business elites inside the, the, the recipient countries. Um, and so it's a kind of a win-win situation for both the, the China government and the, the local governments. Um, the second thing is also <laughs> some similarity, but is from the other side, well, do you think China, because this is a public money somehow, 
So do you think that because of this fragmentation or does the central government tries to make use of this internal fragmentation uh, between the public and private companies or the, the lack of clarity between, uh, between uh, where these two types of companies fall um, that it's actually it's not a it's not a foreign policy it's not a public policy but it's rather a private market thing like it's a private market uh, agreement between uh, the Chinese side and the Egyptian side for example or Sri Lankan side because in the case of Egypt, when it comes to very debatable projects, for example, the, explor uh, the, the exportation of natural gas, for example, to, to Israel, out of nowhere, uh, a private company uh, arose and then uh, the whole thing was w came to the public like, okay, it's a private market. We are not, uh, we are not involved as a government in these types of, gov of agreements, which is, of course, uh, was a very... Uh, hot topic but then again uh, the government said okay you cannot just uh, oppose it because it's a private market thing yeah that's it i can use this one it's up to you um, what should the 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 eu do um, it all depends on the which position you take if you put yourself uh, in the seat of uh, EU uh, leader, um, first, the first easy answer would be to apply the, the EU regulations, which say that for, either for all public uh, tender, uh, there should be an open call and uh, a competition between potential companies that will uh, implement, will the win the market and implement it which is not the case with the BRRI because it is not open tender and it is, and it is always Chinese companies that build the, 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 the project. So, and this is a, a huge point of contention uh, between the EU and, and China and there have been already cases of the building of railway in uh, Hungary uh, where uh, the EU uh, said you have not respected the EU rules and uh, you have to make a new uh, public uh, call to let European uh, companies able to compete with the Chinese companies. The problem is uh, for the EU to stay uh, united and to have uh, something to propose in exchange to uh, East European and South European countries because the uh, structural fund to develop uh, infrastructure now are not the ones that uh, used to, ha to exist uh, when, for instance, Spain and Portugal uh, joined the EU, there was a wave of investment in these countries with money coming from Brussels. It is no more the case now. Uh, so uh, if the EU is not able to propose an alternative to Chinese money, uh, these countries will find a way to, 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 to take Chinese money for sure. And, and they will open um, uh, new uh, divisions within the EU to bargain the possibility to get Chinese money in exchange of political support to some uh, uh, position that the EU wants to take. For instance, you have already countries like Greece who refuse to follow the official EU position to condemn uh, violations of human rights in, uh, in China uh, against the Uyghur or other, uh, other people precisely because uh, Greece and other countries wanted to bargain in Brussels to get the Chinese money. Uh, so you see how, how it is uh, difficult to organize a, a, a unified response to, to, to China, but the, the EU is starting to, to doing it in order to protect the key technologies uh, in Europe which are linked to uh, security uh, issues. The problem is that even in this area, uh, there are divisions between Germany, France and other countries to define what are these key uh, areas and uh, what precisely uh, uh, the, the sectors and the companies uh, are. Regarding China, to, to answer the, your question, uh, there, there is, uh, among the internal tension in China, is uh, some Chinese are uh, saying, why is our government spending so much money abroad while there are still parts of China which are uh, poor, underdeveloped, and uh, uh, we don't have uh, the infrastructure that uh, Chinese companies are building uh, elsewhere. Uh, 
so that was part of the Go West uh, strategy uh, before the uh, BRI was announced. Uh, and the government is trying to answer to, uh, to the local people in the western part of China because we are making uh, negotiations and uh, in investing uh, in Central Asia, for instance, uh, we are opening uh, uh, new uh, trade routes with these countries and you will benefit from it because you will have highways, railways, pipelines that will cross the western uh, provinces of China uh, to trade with uh, Central Asia or Iran or other countries and uh, you will benefit from it. And in a sense, it is, it is true because when I say that Chinese workers are building this infrastructure, that's for sure, uh, and, and not the, the, the foreign workers. So they are benefiting in part from it, but uh, once the, the, the construction sites are finished, uh, they are not, um, they, are, they may be dismissed and lose their jobs. Uh, there are countries, host countries, uh, which are strong enough to uh, uh, bargain uh, tightly with China. It is the case of uh, Malaysia, for instance, who has decided after the victory of Mahathir at the last uh, election uh, uh, to renegotiate a lot of Chinese uh, projects with, within Malaysia with success. Uh, Myanmar has also done it to reduce the, the investment in the Kyokshu uh, port uh, within Myanmar. Uh, so there are examples of uh, Thailand is doing it uh, by dragging its feet to construct the high, uh, high speed railway between uh, Laos and, uh, and Malaysia, which cross Thailand. So there are many uh, instances in which uh, countries are able to uh, uh, say no to China or renegotiate part of the project with, uh, with profits. Uh, so it shows that uh, it, is, uh, it is possible. Um, but not all countries, Laos uh, or Cambodia, are not in a position because of the nature of their government to uh, negotiate uh, to the profit of their own uh, economies. Regarding uh, Egypt, uh, I have never heard so far uh, about uh, important Chinese uh, projects within Egypt, but I'm convinced that uh, they will have, there will be a mm -hmm. Chinese project within Egypt due to the, the strategic importance of the Canal of Suez for China as for all other uh, countries which have to uh, send ships across the, the, the canal. And if one day there is any project to enlarge the canal, you will have for sure uh, many Chinese companies who will say we want to do it and uh, uh, for uh, a bargain price. Uh, for instance, China has already proposed to uh, uh, make a new canal to uh, cut uh, Thailand in two pieces uh, to avoid the Malacca Strait, which is a, an old project. And the Thai government is refusing for a uh, the strategic reason. They don't want their country being cut in two pieces. Uh, but who knows, with the new Thai government in the future, you may, you may see it, uh, and it, it may happen in other uh, parts of the world too. So maybe one day you will see a new uh, canal uh, in, in Egypt <laughs> with Chinese. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really not updated on, the, on Egypt, and I uh, will try to, to, to do better the next time. But my question was like, do you think do you think that there is a, a commonality between the types of projects that China selects for such agreements that these are the projects that have been um, on the agenda for a very long time, for example, in for the domestic government? Usually they, they don't reinvent completely uh, the world. They use old projects and they say, uh, you wanted to do it for a long time, but you, you didn't have the money. We have the money. We can, we can do it for you. And this is how it works. Thank you so much.